Good morning, and welcome to the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy's live weekly broadcast. I'm Roberta Oster, the Communications Director. Our program brings you insight and perspective from policy and faith experts, legislators, and community leaders. During these difficult times dealing with COVID-19 and racial justice, our broadcast focuses on economic, racial, social, and environmental justice issues here in Virginia. We also share resources and opportunities for you to get involved in our work advancing social justice and helping our neighbors. We keep you up to date and we keep our elected officials accountable. Today, we will address a critical issue that will be a top priority for the upcoming 2021 General Assembly, public transportation, justice, and climate. I am pleased to introduce our guests. Karen Camblin is the Environmental and Climate Justice Chair of the Virginia State Conference of the NAACP. Welcome, Karen. And Wyatt Gordon is the Policy and Campaigns Manager for Land Use and Transportation for the Virginia Conservation Network. And welcome, Wyatt. And our third guest is Stuart Schwartz, who is Executive Director of the Coalition for Smarter Growth. And we are thrilled to have all of you here with us today. I will hand this off to our moderator, my colleague and friend, Reverend Dr. Faith Harris, who is Co-Director of Virginia Interfaith Power and Light. Faith? Good morning, Roberta, and good morning, guests. Uh, it's really great to be here on this uh, lovely uh, Thursday morning. Um, transportation has the dubious role of being number the number one greenhouse gas emissions uh, for uh, in our economy, and many of us believe it is a sector with great potential for transition to a clean economy. Public transportation is also critical in this transition, and our guests today have been thinking about this issue and have great ideas for addressing it. So let's just jump in. Um, and I'm gonna lob this question to all of you, uh, have all of you answer it, and uh, Wyatt, you can start first. Um, tell us more about the role the sector plays in climate change, and what does the average person sitting at their kitchen table need to know about the role of transportation? Yeah, thank you for having me, Faith. I'm really uh, delighted to be a part of this. Um, when we think about climate change, we typically think about big power plants, fumes going everywhere. What we don't think about is our own vehicles, um, but transportation actually makes up 48% of all climate pollution. Um, so that's a lot of carbon emissions. You have to think every time you drive and use a gallon of gasoline, that's the equivalent of about five pounds of coal being dropped into your water, your air, um, into your lungs. So we do have a real problem with transportation, and it's one that's going to be harder to tackle than we've had with energy generation because we have over 8 million vehicles in Virginia with over 8 million people in Virginia, and that's a lot different than trying to tackle just a handful of bad power plants. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wyatt. Uh, Stuart? You're on mute, Stuart. That was an excellent summary from, from Wyatt. Uh, and uh, it is very much the case that uh, transportation is the next frontier, the next thing we have to battle. There should be all sorts of credit to uh, Virginia Interfaith Power and Light, Virginia Conservation Network, Southern Environmental Law Center, and so many other groups on the uh, fight on the energy sector and how much we've achieved in Virginia, obviously some more to do, but we're, we now have a, a situation in place where we can reduce the emissions from our energy sector. But transportation is why it notes is now our number one source of emissions. Uh, the good news is we can do something about this together. And what we do about it actually creates more livable communities, more social equity, uh, reduces other pollution, air pollution, uh, saves land for farms and forests. And that's the smart growth alternatives we've been working on for years. The revitalization of our cities, walkable, inclusive communities uh, with great transit access. All of those things mean that we can each drive less, uh, take transit, walk and bike more, and reduce our emissions. You know, Wyatt talked about the equivalence to the amount of coal 
uh, emissions that you get when you drive a car. And I think we do have to get to the point where we think twice, each of us, before we turn the key uh, on the ignition, if we happen to have a, a car, um, because, you know, every trip you're contributing to what is an existential crisis. Um, just like the pandemic, it's something we have to tackle together. And it doesn't have to be onerous because the sorts of places we're trying to create for people are, are more inclusive, more livable, more sustainable. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Karen, what is your uh, response to this? What are the people sitting around their kitchen tables? What do they need to know in order to understand how public transportation and transportation is a, not only a climate change issue, but a justice issue? Uh, thank you so much for having me here today, Faith. Um, and I think transportation is just a very important discussion that I'm glad that it's finally getting the uh, spotlight that it deserves. Um, transportation is more than just moving people from one place to another or moving goods and, uh, from one place to another in the fastest um, possible way. Uh, transportation is a way in which individuals and communities can experience economic prosperity, um, be able to enjoy um, a higher quality of life, have access to medical facilities um, with greater service as well as higher education. And that's just to name a few. Um, as Wyatt had mentioned, we have these very um, noxious and polluting um, facilities throughout um, uh, our communities that um, ex um, it, uh, emits a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and pollutants and particulates. Um, National NAACP developed a report not too long ago called Fumes Across the Fence Line that talked about the health mm -hmm. issues that are in, uh, associated with these types of facilities. And they identified that school children on average miss about 101,000 sick days per year. And if you think about it, that's also impacting the economic, uh, not economic, the education achievement of our children. So what can we do as individuals to make sure that we transition to, an, uh, um, uh, to a cleaner, um, a green economy, and be able to make sure that transportation is a part of that um, uh, solution. Um, during COVID, a lot of people have um, relied on other types of transportation um, than their single vehicle. They've had the opportunity to be able to walk and be able to experience their trails more. I live within walking distance from my from my supermarket, so I can walk and pick up a few things and come back home. And you know, um, and another thing that we need to do is have individuals talk to their local elected officials and their transportation agencies that are the ones that are developing those bus routes and talk about the need for having better amenities at bus stops and make it safer for people to be able to travel um, and use alternate transportation options and be able to leave their cars at home um, more often. Thank you, Karen. Uh, one of the things that I often think about when I, I work at Virginia Union University, I teach there, and one of the things I often think about when I go to work is we are within, you know, it feels like you could just reach out and touch uh, 95 and 64. And uh, many of the uh, black and brown and poor neighborhoods were often, uh, we see that they're often located near major highways, and that wasn't an accident. Uh, we know that there was uh, there was there were reasons for why that's so, uh, but we also recognize that there, that means that there are going to be many more um, that the people who live in those communities are going to imp be impacted much more by um, you know the the emissions that come from our single use cars, um, and so when we talk when we think about that, um, you know, one often people say that one of the ways to address this issue or or it's the most simple way or the easiest thing to do is to just do electric vehicles. Uh, what are your thoughts about that, Wyatt? Uh, why is that not the only answer or the most important answer um, to the overall question about justice and transportation and moving to a clean economy? Yeah, thank you, Faith. Um, 
So electric vehicles are definitely going to be part of the solution. There are always going to be some trips that we're not going to be able to shift to transit, walking, and biking. Um, but when we think about electric vehicles as the only solution, that's not really a solution for the climate. Um, just to produce one electric vehicle is the equivalent of driving a regular vehicle, 93,000 miles. That's the amount of emissions that are produced. We also have to think that tire treads are actually the number one source of microplastics in our water. Um, so just helping everyone to electrify isn't a magic bullet. Um, it also doesn't solve a lot of the larger societal problems that we have based off of car dependence. When you think about here in Metro Richmond, the average person who rides the bus only has access to about 38% of jobs. That was not done by accident. Um, probably the worst thing that's ever happened for low-income communities in Richmond and of late was the creation of 288 that pushed more and more jobs and housing outside of the reach of public transportation. So when we think about how to fix this solution, we really need to start from what's what's most effective and what's also cheapest, and that's changing our land use. Um, so right now in Richmond, we only have about 67% of our city is zoned for single family, which means you can't get a multifamily unit, maybe a duplex or um, a fourplex or some apartments. There's just inherently going to be cheaper for folks and easier for people to afford. Um, and then beyond that, we have to think about making it safe to walk and bike around. We don't have any infrastructure for people really to move safely. Uh, I live on Northside. I bike past VUU quite a lot to go downtown, but even the Lombardi bike lane is not a very safe one. It's just a little bit of paint on the road. So it's hard to blame people for not making choices when we don't look at the larger system that at the federal level is spending 80% of our transportation dollars on highways. And even at the state level, you just saw the creation of um, the CVTA here in Richmond. Um, and that only puts 15% of the money into GRTC. So we have to really look at our priorities and ask why our budgets don't reflect our values. Thank you, Wyatt. Stuart, I, I would like for you to also uh, respond to that question. Why is electrification of the transportation system not enough or, or not the best uh, approach? You're still on, you're on mute. Sorry. I'm trying to be good and, and mute just in case the dog barks. Um, no, the, uh, I, I appreciate this question because electric vehicles are going to be critical. We're going to have to use every tool in the toolbox. We definitely want to start with electrification of, of buses, school buses, and uh, public transit buses. We want to uh, electrify the fleets of government fleets of vehicles or uh, commercial fleets to the extent that we can. Uh, at the same time, we've been able to show that electric vehicles won't be enough for uh, reducing emissions, slashing them the way we need to by 2030, 2045, and 2050. And to do that, we need smart growth. We need these walkable, mixed-use, transit-oriented communities. And uh, we've got a report, I'll put it in the chat right now, that Bill Pugh on our team, our senior policy fellow, just did, uh, focused uh, on the D.C. region, but... Uh, making this connection, why electric vehicles will not be sufficient. There's another great report. I'll find the link for you and put it in there. It's Dangerous by Design by our partners at the national level, Smart Growth America and Transportation for America. And uh, it, it just shows that we we have to do both. We have to electrify the fleet and the vehicles, but we also have to create more walkable communities. One of the challenges is you could electrify all the vehicles out there. We'd have to provide enough power for all that. And that would, how many how many solar farms would we have to put in place of farms or forests if we did that? Uh, so we really also have to drive less, even if we have electric vehicles. The other thing about electric vehicles is they would still need highways. Those those are destructive of the landscape, they're of the environment. They um, climate uh, greenhouse gas emissions are used in, in making all that concrete as well. And then lastly, there are equity issues. Uh, you know, cars and vehicles are expensive. It's ninety six hundred to dollars at least a year, according to AAA, to buy and own and finance a, a car, one car. Can you imagine a two or three car household? And electric vehicles so far are not any cheaper. And so they are expensive for everybody. And money you'd spend on your vehicle could be money you could be saving for your kid's college education. So investing in public transit and smart growth remain our top priority. 
So for many of us, uh, those of us who, you know, both uh, Virginia Interfaith Center and Virginia Interfaith Power and Light, we are uh, we are in conversation with people of faith uh, in all backgrounds. And uh, we're very uh, concerned about this issue as a, who might be very concerned about this issue as a values and ethics issue. Um, tell us a little bit, Karen, about why it's so important for us to be thinking differently about how we uh, plan and um, develop communities. Uh, what does that mean for us? Uh, and how does that challenge the way that we live now? Um, yes, thanks, Faith. Uh, this is a really great question. And um, I there isn't a one um, solution for addressing transportation. As we move forward, we need to make sure that we don't make the, the mistakes of the past, the errors of the past, I should say, and the deliberate errors of the past in which transportation was used as a means to destroy uh, black and brown communities as a means to um, discriminate against um, black and brown populations and as a way to um, let it serve as a barrier to prevent access and mobility for a certain uh, for black and brown communities. So we have to be very careful that as we move forward with these and um, green in our transportation, decarbonize in our transportation system, that we make sure that it's distributed in an equitable manner. So how, what does that look like? If we're do electrifying our fleets, if we're, we need to look at where those charging stations are gonna be, we need to make sure that there is an equal amount of um, um, in infrastructure, both in low income and in communities with a higher concentration of black and brown um, individuals and families. We need to make sure that the technology is affordable and accessible for all. And not only that, as we are re reimagining our transportation systems, we need to make sure that there are also transportation options for neighborhoods to be able to get to those activity centers that we're, we talk about so much, right? The retail centers, the, the, ed, the, inst the, the education in institutions and those things. What solutions we give to an urban environment is going to be different from what we would do in a suburban environment and what we can do in a rural environment. But what we need to do for one and, and foremost is a lot of those solutions or mainly all of those solutions need to be community based. Um, and the community can also be a part of these solutions. And so in rural communities where we don't have those densities per se, let's say, um, and maybe with buses will not be as um, effective and efficient as they would be in an urban environment and suburban environment. There are cases in which the um, the religious community would, you know, supplement and provide and help to supplement and complement the transportation options for their communities and help with that, whether it be paratransit or um, um, supporting um, senior citizens. So, um, the, it, it is a very, it is a moral issue. I will admit transportation is a civic right. Um, and so, um, as I said, you know, as we move forward with these solutions, we just have to make sure that we make, make these options and these infrastructure changes available for everyone to be able to enjoy and, and, and benefit from. So you raised some really important issues in that. Um, you know, I'm thankful that you raised the issue of rural communities, because oftentimes when we think about public transportation, you know, people just immediately <laughs> erase rural communities and don't realize that in many ways, uh, you know, there's there's still people in rural communities who don't have access to cars and as well, and or they're forced to have access to cars. And that, uh, you know, again, um, you know, is a drain on their budget and it makes it very hard for them to get to uh, to work and to shopping and to uh, and to be part of, uh, you know, just the economy overall. Um, and I think that it's uh, also critical that we think about not just um, not just about public transportation, but how all of this, the transportation in particular, how it actually impacts affordable housing and development, uh, future development. How, like, what does it mean for us to be thinking about future development and housing um, in a conversation or in the context of transportation and public transportation? Uh, Wyatt, I'm going to start with you, and then Stuart, if you would answer it as well. Yeah, I 
just love Karen's answer. That was really fantastic. Um, I myself was raised in a faith-based community, um, have a deep rooting in that. Um, and one of the things I always think about is like treating people like your neighbor. Um, and I think so much of American society has become so scared of having neighbors. Um, we see people trying to pull away from gathering spaces, um, you know, and I think one of the most important things that you can do is just be a voice for having more neighbors. Um, it's very easy for people to put a sign out in their front yard that says Black Lives Matter. It's very different to be an advocate for diverse forms of housing. Maybe it's, you know, in-law suites in someone's backyard. Maybe it's having an apartment building down the block. But the reality is that if we want to have integrated communities, we have to start creating space for low income and people of color. And that's not always a thing that you see people feeling comfortable with. Um, so I think partly, you know, we have to look at our policies and what we're doing in a systemic level. But I think it also is going to require us to look into our hearts and ask what type of communities do we want to live in? Why? Why are some of us scared when a new bus route is announced and it's going to be passing through our community? Um, you know, we've been seeing a lot of that here in Richmond in the fan, which is ostensibly one of our, you know, densest, most friendly liberal communities. Uh, but they've been pushing back really hard to try and get the new GRTC Route 77 moved. Um, even though that's a really vital lifeline for a lot of people who work at the University of Richmond or work at VCU as it connects those two campuses through the fan. So to a certain extent, I think we're, we're really just going to have to look at our own hearts and ask, well, am I making a community that has more options for people that don't earn the same thing as me, that don't have the same skin tone that I do, um, that don't have the same educational background? So. Um, yeah, I think it is also a personal problem uh, that we need to do some soul searching over. Yeah, we really need to do, uh, as relig a people of faith, uh, really need to uh, weigh in on this issue and really do some serious work, uh, even within our own communities, our own faith communities, about what does it mean to be neighbor? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to, to, be, to welcome the stranger? There are many, we have a lot of good work we have a lot of good information. We have a lot of good sacred uh, rhetoric, but um, we often don't see it in our uh, show up in our policies and in the way that we organize our lives. And I think that would be um, that's a critical um, that's a critical element to this conversation. Uh, well, Dr. Harris and, and why I just I can't match those in terms of eloquence about this. Um, I will share one of my favorite uh, yard signs that we, I can't think, of, I can't remember if it came from Minnesota, which was Neighbors for More Neighbors uh, was their campaign. It's also interesting to look at some of the disparities we sometimes see in, in, in signs and how they might not jive. And uh, up in Montgomery County, there's a wonderful guy named Dan Reed. He's an urbanist. He's on my board uh, and uh, he blogs it or his Twitter handle is just up the pike. And he's got pictures of, you know, Black Lives Matter and inclusion signs right next to signs opposing new development in the neighborhood. So, um, you know, there's, there's quite the ironic contrast there. Um, you mentioned affordable housing and someone else here mentioned about budget priorities as, as, as a moral imperative. And, you know, those two things go together in our minds. To us, affordable housing is the most important infrastructure investment that our state and federal and local governments could be making right now. And I'd like to note that $100 million spent on affordable housing is far more valuable than $100 million on yet another highway interchange that makes no difference at all, makes pollution worse, continues to provide, you know, create traffic and destroys the fabric of communities. You know, $100 million in affordable housing means a roof over people's heads. It means stability for children so that they can have the chance to concentrate and learn better in school without being stressed all the time. It's a chance to have stability for the family as a whole and to build wealth. And of course, this housing is best if it's close to transit in a walkable neighborhood with, uh, with many services nearby. Um, this was before the murder of George Floyd, but in the midst of the pandemic crisis, we issued a statement, a call to action in the D.C. area. And, and basically, this goes to the budget. The moral imperative is to change our spending priorities. Let's, let's move the money 
from highways into affordable housing, from highways into transit. Um, let's take care of the, the needs of those who don't make a living wage and put that first. And I think we would find that the entire economy would be better off as a, as a, as a function of that. And of course, all of our families would be better off as well. Karen, did you want to say anything, uh, anything in response to Wyatt or Stuart before we move to our next question? Um, no, not really. I think they both um, captured everything so well, um, uh, how important that transportation, um, land use, zoning, and housing are linked. And we can no longer move forward, you know, making or identifying solutions for any of these issues in silos. They need to have um, consideration together. Um, and as we um, develop um, and, and reimagine, which I think this new administration is going to be um, 100 percent behind is the reimagining of our transportation systems that we really need to identify. This is a really great opportunity for community development, a really great opportunity to to fix some of these errors that have been made and an excellent opportunity to remove those barriers that are keeping um, a lot of our communities at a stalemate right now. So I see we have a question that just came in. What do you think of GRTC Pulse in Richmond? I'm going to take that question first, and then I'll move to uh, the our, one of our uh, questions. Um, we can start with you, Karen, if you'd like. What do you think of the GRTC Pulse in, in um, I'm going to have to defer that one to Wyatt. I live in Northern Virginia. I'm in Fairfax. I, I you know, I'll just face value, I think it's a great, it, it looks great, um, but I, I'm going to, pass it on to the local expert, Wyatt. I'm happy to jump in. Um, yeah, I'm assuming this question gets it a little bit. Sometimes people pick on the pulse um, because they see it as an inequitable investment. Um, I think the bigger picture that we really need to look at is the master plan that we had for transit in Richmond was to have six pulses. So we wanted to have lines that crisscross the entire region um, so not just east-west, we wanted things that were going also north-south into Henrico, down into Chesterfield. The original vision was really to have a very robust, rapid transit system, which is something that Richmond desperately needs. Um, the fact is that we haven't had the investment to do that. We haven't had the money. The Pulse was created with the Tiger Grant from the Obama administration. It cost about $62 million dollars. Um, that is a lot of money, but it's actually not that much money when you think that the Central Virginia Transportation Authority is expected to bring in about $180 million annually. So when you think about what are we going to invest the money in, what are we as a region saying our values are, I think instead of looking to projects like expanding the Powhite Parkway or Route 76 or other interstates that cost hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, for what purpose? We need to look and say, why are we not building this BRT system out to service all parts of our region in an equitable manner? We have people in the counties also who rely upon transit, who need this as an option. Um, so I think it's about overcoming our history of segregation and intentional displacement and separation of communities. There's a reason that the majority of your bus lines ended the Richmond city line. There's a reason that Chesterfield County only just recently added in the Route 111. Um, that's because when I talk with folks about what does housing and transportation have to do with race, they're the building blocks of segregation. You know, if you can control where people live and where people have access via their mobility, you've de facto segregated your entire region. And that's why we've seen in recent data that Richmond is one of the three worst segregated cities in our entire state. Um, so I want to draw back to Karen's point earlier. Um, we like to think, oh, this was, oops, like, why did we plow this highway through the prosperous community of Jackson Ward? Why did we completely destroy the black community of Granite with 76? Um, these weren't mistakes. These were done intentionally. Um, so 
as much as people want to be colorblind in the way that we create policies going forward and say that everyone deserves to do things equally, that's neglecting hundreds of years of people going out of their way to be hateful and to destroy prosperous, vibrant black communities. So we really need to set equity as an anchor. It needs to be the goal that we're aiming for. And every decision that we make should be asking the question of how are we healing the wrongs of the past? Um, Richmond is a place where we, we look at our history and we know how horrible um, things have been here in the past. We're the number two largest port that imported slaves. We had over 300,000 bodies and chains come through our downtown. So if we make policy that doesn't take that history into account, then we're being heartless. So I would just ask people, you know, money is our value. So let's look at brand new sources of funding like the CVTA and let's Let's follow up on our promises to folks. Let's build a pulse down into Southside so that those communities also have access to rapid, reliant transit service, which means they can pick up an extra class at their community college, get a certification, not worry about missing their kids' daycare pickup and paying overage fines. Like transit is freedom, so we need to invest in people's freedom. I love the way that you just um, framed that as freedom. Um, and we talk about freedom in this country in many, many ways, but I think that this is really a critical lens for looking at this issue, that we're thinking about equity, we're talking about justice, and we're talking about what it really means to be free and to have all the opportunities and advantages uh, available to every one of our citizens and our residents. Um, so that uh, we actually are creating a future that everyone uh, can uh, can benefit from. Uh, and, 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 and when I say everyone, I mean everyone. It's not really only just about, uh, you know, healing the wrongs. They need to be healed and they need to be addressed. But the truth is it's the smart thing to do because it will create uh, a, an economy that is livable for, for everyone. Stuart, did you want to weigh in before I ask our final question? Well, I don't know if I can uh, match Wyatt, but I will add some detail to, to that. Um, by the way, Dr. Harris, I think he should be a guest preacher somewhere here in Richmond uh, or on the, on the, on the circuit. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the thing about the Pulse is very interesting. We were engaged in Partnership for Smarter Growth with our partners at RVA Rapid Transit uh, when we had to save the Pulse. We had to save uh, Richmond, convince the Richmond City Council uh, to take the money to do the pulse, but we also did it in conjunction with a campaign to fund, and all credit goes to the state uh, for this, uh, a redesign of the entire network so everybody could have uh, better access as a result of the investment in the pulse and creating a unified network with the pulse and, and the other GRTC routes. And the study showed, the analysis showed that it would significantly increase access to jobs uh, for people in the city. Um, they could get to more places faster with this combination. Uh, but that was a budget neutral decision to re, you know, and it didn't involve more money. With more money, you can both increase frequency of service and coverage of service. Uh, this is something that, that we need to do. By the way, I should not fail to mention Reverend Ben Campbell because we would not have this new Richmond network we would not have this new the commitment to transit in this region that we see today and the change we're seeing without him. Um, and so he's taught me a lot over the years. I, I live just a few blocks from Richmond Hill, which he helped found as an ecumenical center and has always played a role in anti-poverty here in the city with, with many others, others in the faith community. The Central Virginia Transportation Authority is an interesting one. We were not happy with it at the Partnership for Smarter Growth. Um, it uh, only allocates 15% of the funding to transit, and it uh, allowed the jurisdictions to also cut existing funding by 50%. Uh, even the city supported that, that uh, provision, and we didn't. Uh, honestly, this region should be spending 100% of new dollars on transit because it's already built plenty of highways. Uh, in addition to the highways that were plowed through African-American neighborhoods in our city here of Richmond, uh, the one we shouldn't forget that highways like 288 
are equally inequitable in that th- those were designed to hollow out the city, to bring more inve- more jobs and investment far out, out of the reach of public transit, out of the reach of, of people who could not afford to live that far out or move that far out. And that was all arranged with just the sort of same backroom dealing as the original highways through the city were back then. And not, not in the not too distant past. I think all of what we're seeing here um, and what we're discussing and the issues that are being raised uh, uh, related to equity and justice are really important issues for people of faith, of every faith background to be thinking about and to be, um, you know, finding ways to exercise their voice and to ensure that we change these policies and the way that we, um, you know, fund and budget for, for, for public transportation and for affordable housing and development. So I, I think that this is just an exciting, um, really exciting show. I'm so thankful that all of you are so, ha- so, uh, so willing to be part of this conversation. Um, I want to ask another question. This is really pretty much our fa- uh, final question. Um, and that has to do with, um, that has to do with the way that we uh, we all are looking forward to um, G- GA 2021. And uh, so what are the, uh, I'd like for you to talk about a little bit about what are the policies that you, uh, that we are all uh, supporting, um, any that your organization might be, um, be uh, advocating for um, and, uh, and why? And I let's start with uh, let's start with Stuart. Actually, I am gonna I'm gonna defer. Uh, first of all, I will mention uh, divert on one federal or two federal issues. I've just put in the chat a link to Coalition for Smart Growth Alert, one of many out there. Virginia Transit Association and others are doing this as well. We hashtag Save Transit. While Congress is still in session, trying to hammer out a bipartisan deal, we need to save transit. They are proposing 15 billion uh, for transit. It's not secure in the deal. We actually need 32 billion, and that's what that says. The second one is a great alert from Transportation for America, which says that we're not in the 1950s anymore, and we should be equalizing funding for uh, high, between highways and transit. Transit only gets 20 percent of the federal transportation package; it should be getting 50 percent. So I commend those to you. But Wyatt, as our coordinator for VCN's land use and transportation agenda, I defer to him in talking about legislation from that perspective, and Karen who's got her hands in all the pots, including VCN and the Green New Deal, should should also update you. Karen, Wyatt, which one of you would like to uh, tackle this first? It's a big agenda. I'll let Karen go first. You just launched the Green New Deal last night. So yeah, you thank you. Have exciting um, news. Okay, so first I'll start off with the Virginia State Conference and WACP. I serve as the Environmental and Climate Justice Chair. So my focus um, for the 2021 legislative um, session is going to be wh- how, what are the legislative bills that are either going to support and complement the removal of barriers and, 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 and breaking down those barriers and allowing our communities to thrive. Um, and part of that is the, the, the type of activity that encourages and, and, um, further, um, worsens our climate, um, further worsens, um, the, um, the environmental space of communities, right? So how do we combat those? So some of the legislations that we will be supporting for the NAACP is still being, um, we're still finalizing our, our, our agenda packet, so I'm not very comfortable, you know, um, uh, uh, announcing some of our bills as yet. But we are going to be looking at ways in which we combat climate change, support transportation, and make sure that environmental justice and equity is at the forefront for all of our different state agencies. Um, and that is also supporting the strengthening of the Environmental Justice Act that you are also a part of and everybody on, on the screen is a part of as well. Um, also, I am a... Um, a uh, co-director for the Green New Deal Coalition, uh, Virginia Coalition, which is a statewide grassroots coalition that uh, purpose is to combat climate change and the inequities that are, are, are all, all of our residents in the Commonwealth is experiencing. And so we just had our, legisl- our 2021 legislative um, kickoff and call to action last night. Um, and the um, link to our legislative packet is um, on the screen right now. But 
Um, our biggest focus is not just transportation, like I said, but just to make sure that we can develop a healthier space. And one of that is um, removing all of those polluting um, uh, uh, facilities, um, as well as preventing the um, um, cr um, building of new fossil fuel in in infrastructure. So we will be reintroducing the Green New Deal Act, as well as a moratorium on all new fossil fuels. And we will be supporting legislation that is going to uh, promote strong worker protection, such as repealing right to work, um, as well as e um, equal pay and sick pay uh, leave. And then we're also going to be supporting transportation projects, just such as modernizing the transportation stops, as well as the clean car, um, the um, the advanced clean car standards. And then there are going to be some really great resolutions that are going to be introduced, um, such as declaring um, climate change as a statewide emergency, as well as, well as um, water is being a civil right. And she, so um, our, our, uh, uh, our link to the Green New Deal uh, 2021 legislative call to action is on our screen right now. Um, okay, so I'll jump in and add some other things. Um, so we talked about how, you know, really racial, economic, climate justice, it's going to come down to housing and trans public transportation. Um, so on the housing front, there's some exciting bills this upcoming General Assembly session. Um, we have one that's going to be a study on accessory dwelling units. ADUs are just a very jargony way to say in-law suites, uh, granny suites, um, all this type of kind of smaller housing so that if you as a family you have uh, an elderly member that you'd like to have a little bit closer uh, maybe on the same lot but not in the same house um, adus make that accessible and possible so there's going to be a study on that of how we can implement that statewide um, we have another bill uh, that's also being carried by delegate samira up in fairfax um, that is looking at community land trusts um, so this would allow community land trusts to buy blighted or abandoned properties at the market rate uh, before they get auctioned off by localities. Um, community land trusts are kind of the number one way to build permanently affordable housing right now. Uh, we only have one in Richmond, but we're hoping this bill will bring some attention to that model so that we can get community land trusts and other parts of the state going as well. Um, Lastly, there's a low income housing tax credit that's likely going to be introduced. Um, that would mirror the federal level tax credit. Um, the federal tax credit has been responsible for about 80% of all affordable housing built over the, the last 30 years. Um, we've seen red and blue states across the US, um, about 18 of them develop their own state version. So this could be a big win for affordable housing. What's really important for us is in the rulemaking section that we uh, ensure that proposals that include um, a location close to transit or developers who are willing to pay more to boost transit frequency along those buildings, that they receive extra preference, um, additional points. Because one of the problems we see is that we build affordable housing um, in the middle of nowhere. And then as Stuart mentioned, you still have to spend $10,000 per car and a lot of households have to have two cars just to get to work the way our current system has built out car dependency. So you might have an apartment that between the two of you is only $400 and it's manageable, but then you have car payments every month um, that are up to like $1,600 and then your lifestyle isn't really affordable at all. Um, and then on the public transportation front, we have two really exciting proposals. Um, one is being carried by Delegate McQuinn, um, and that is a transit modernization study. This is basically a comprehensive look at how do we make public transportation the most comfortable, convenient, and easy option for folks in Virginia to get around. Um, so we're looking at everything from benches and shelters so you can stay out of the wind and rain when you're taking those trips, um, all the way up to more advanced things like integrated payment systems. Can you just tap a payment card to board faster and easier? Um, does every bus in Virginia have GPS tracking? So you can look at your phone and you can trust that that bus is actually coming. Um, that's a level of reliability that people have gotten used to with Uber and Lyft. And if our public transit can't compete, then it's not going to be able to compete. So 
Um, also, we have to look at how we electrify our buses. We we kind of forget that some of our worst buses, the diesel buses, tend to be the routes that uh, operate in low income neighborhoods. So electrifying buses is also going to be a huge boon to low income communities who tend to deal with respiratory illnesses much worse than people who are in more affluent and greener areas that weren't redlined. Um, the effects of COVID, we've seen that, what chronic respiratory health can, can have uh, for life and death consequences. Um, and the last exciting thing that we have going on transit is a fair rider representation uh, bill, which may or may not become part of the study, we'll see. Um, but that proposal is just to make sure that uh, councils of riders and people who use paratransit, uh, the transit option for um, those that are disabled, that they have a voice in their, their future, you know, their destiny. And that for each transit provider in Virginia, um, we are ensuring that there's a representative from the riders and a representative of paratransit riders that sit on the full board with the rest of the decision makers um, so that we know that those rider voices are being heard in the most powerful halls of our public transportation policy. Um, and it's just going to be a really exciting time to change our culture around what it means to ride transit and to see taking the bus as a good thing you can do for the climate, a good thing you can do for social solidarity. Um, I mean, I personally just see glimpses into other people's stories every time I ride the bus. You don't necessarily think about the person in your community that is disabled and might be prone to seizures and can't ride a bus. There are a lot of invisible disabilities that we can't see, but there are so many stories woven into riding uh, public transportation. So I would encourage everyone to just go out and look how you can replace one trip a week with transit. And um, it's a pretty infectious thing. You get to see a lot of beautiful stories every day. Yeah, I want to echo that. I mean, when the pulse opened and in the months after that, as we watched ridership grow and grow and grow, um, it was so great to see the city all come together. All, all walks of life of the city came together on our transit system. People who hadn't ridden buses in years or ever were suddenly riding the bus. They were seeing what our city could be in terms of, you know, comparing to cities like DC that have been very successful with everybody uh, riding the bus. And hopefully a post pandemic with the vaccine, uh, we will return to that. Uh, and the key, of course, is having it accessible, having it very frequent where you don't have to look at your watch to, to find it and you can just jump on it and, it, and, and it's easy. If uh, As Richmond grows, we want more people, we want more housing and a range of affordability in the housing. Um, Richmond will have to have more transit, more walking, more biking. Uh, we cannot survive choked on cars and of course it wouldn't be healthy either. I do want to make a note, someone I think uh, Anna or Anna had noted in the, in the comments there that you know, it's a short session. It could be a very short session, as we found out. So, and obviously we have a, a an extensive agenda. So, you know, it's going to be tough to get a lot done. Uh, so let's also pay attention to the governor's race. Uh, this is an absolutely critical, groundbreaking governor's race right now. And with all these great coalitions, uh, we absolutely have to brief all of the candidates, uh, get get really through this election, get the state's priorities changed and improved. Uh, we've been making some progress, but we could make a lot more progress, uh, w you know, with uh, a good governor, the next governor. Uh, in particular, I want to note that under the last couple of administrations, we've increased funding for transit in the, in the Commonwealth, uh, including with the bill in uh, 2020 uh, that changed some of the formulas. Uh, we've made record investments in intercity rail. Uh, they've, been, they've funded the pulse and better transit in places like Richmond. On, and they're also funding fare buy-downs. At the same time, transit is still probably only about 16 to 18 percent of our total transportation spending in Virginia. We can do a lot better there. And there's been almost as much energy spent on building really expensive, environmentally destructive toll lanes and other road widenings like 64 in Virginia uh, than there has been to some of the good reforms. And so we would like to, this administration, the North administration, in their last year to do even more, to shift even more money to transit because it's an emergency, in an emergency state right now. 
and to reform some of the other practices at VDOT that keep giving us these super wide highways rather than smart growth and transit alternatives. So as we wrap up um, this uh, conversation, and we could probably go on for hours um, on this topic because it just really takes us on, takes us to so many uh, of the really important issues and factors and components that will really build a, a, an economy that, that works for everyone. Um, what we, we do want to encourage our listeners to reach out to their um, their um, legislators uh, on all of these policy issues. Uh, we really need for um, our legislators to take this up, to see this as an important um, important role for them to play in progressing and moving our economy forward. That in so many um, in so many of our discussions uh, that we hear um, in the narrative, the grand narrative, um, there's all of this discussion about small business and you know, how to grow the economy, but we really aren't thinking smartly uh, and we're not hearing the narrative that we need to hear that talks about uh, growing the economy justly and, 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 and building in and embedding equity um, so that everyone benefits. And I think that is the critical, um, you know, critical communication and message we want to share with our legislators that we want to see an economy that works for everyone that that will uh, hum along, that will increase, that will expand opportunity, and that we will make um, you know freedom really free. <laughs> and so I, when I think about public transportation and this conversation, I've lived in this is probably my fifth major city that I've lived in, uh, and I have never used my car before. Um, the 25 years that I've been in Richmond, I've had to drive. I lived in Chicago. I lived in Atlanta. I lived in a little, I grew up in a little podunk town in New Jersey where I could take either a train or a bus. Um, there were a number of ways for us to get around to our little small podunk idyllic little towns along the shore. Um, and it's just, this is the first time that I've been forced to um, not have an option to use public transportation. Um, and, and I, I uh, often talk about how um, I could read a book a week. Uh, I would get to work so relaxed. Um, I had the opportunity that forced me to walk more. Um, it's just better for us all around. And this is the, again, this is one of the few places that I've lived where there's a kind of a stigma about uh, public transportation and using public transportation. And I hope that all of us can continue to work together to remove that stigma. So if you're listening to this program, get on a bus, uh, take the train if you need to, to DC, uh, put your car, let your car rest uh, and get some rest for yourself. Have a de-stressed trip by using public transportation. Um, I want to, I like to I'll use alliteration. Um, so I wanted to say in this with, we want public transportation in our economy to be smart, safe, secure, and sexy. So let's bring the sexy back to public transportation and all, and all of us find ways to, um, to uh, park our cars and ride when possible. Hey, can I add one teeny tiny thing to that? Please, well? please, I'm please. so sorry about that. Um, in addition to watching the budget, budget, in addition to talking to your legislators, there are a lot of community advisory commissions and boards that are out there that help to um, design and develop the policies and the programs and the operations and the maintenance and the fare systems and all of these different things associated with transit. And we really need to get a fair representation of the community on these boards. So in addition to those outreach opportunities that individuals have, they also, I would highly recommend, particularly transit users, to um, apply for these seats and to be able to have this narrative at the table during the time when these decisions are being made. It's it's great to reach out to your elected official. I love that. The governor just released his budget next um, yesterday. Look at the budget and see where the money is being spent because where the money is being spent, that's what is being considered the priority. And you will see, as Stuart indicated, you know, transportation, transit, um, the bike lanes, the, the the sidewalks, those types of things are getting significantly less funds than it should. 
most of the money is going towards roads. So not only do we construct new roads, we got to find money to maintain these roads, where we do know the cost to build all of these facilities that we're talking about is, is, is relatively cheaper, not only to construct, but to maintain. So it's also a good thing for a budget. So there are just so many different angles, so many different things that anybody can get involved. I am not a number wonk, so I try to avoid the budget talk. But if you are, that's where you need to be. If you like going to meetings and coming up with solutions, get on a board. There's so many different things, but we really need to get that trans transportation and transit discussion out, out, out in the forefront. So I just wanted to add that little thing. So thank I, you for allowing me. I to add a couple of great things that came out of Smart Growth America in the last stimulus in 2009, in that recession, they've proven that uh, maintaining what we've already built in, in highways mm -hmm. and bridges creates more jobs than does building mm -hmm. new highways. Yeah. Uh, just more labor, more jobs, and, and transit naturally creates more jobs and better, higher paying jobs than does this highway spending. So that's one key thing. I think we cannot take our eye off the ball in the Richmond region on the Central Virginia Transportation Authority. But that means you have to watchdog Henrico and Chesterfield and the other suburban counties, uh, much more than Richmond per se. They're the ones we have to convince not to spend just 15 percent on transit, but to spend the lion's share of the money on transit and because they really just want to widen roads. And those they're widening roads, they're increasing sprawl, moving jobs and investment away from, from people. And so we have got to convince these counties to think in a more smart growth, sustainable and equitable manner. I just want to mention our, um, to go to Virginia IPL uh, for uh, our policy goals and policy priorities. And uh, Wyatt and Karen both mentioned many of them, um, the human rights to water, um, that's uh, delegate aired, uh, is patroning that. Uh, that's, a re that's a resolution. Uh, obviously, resolutions do not have uh, you know, any authority with them, but that's a, a good start for a, a conversation about uh, affordability, accessibility, and keeping water uh, safe and drinkable, uh, and and for and accessible for everyone. Uh, we don't want to see continued situations like uh, we saw in Petersburg this uh, during COVID. Um, also, the EJ Act. We are also um, you know supporting and championing that, uh, seeing that bill uh, strengthened, as well as the transportation modernization study that Wyatt talked about as and then also heat stress. Um, uh, that's a very, also an important, climate change is real and it's happening and people who work outside uh, on farms and in, and in any kind of outdoor work uh, are subject to greater, um, greater health impacts because of uh, sometimes 10 uh, days in a row of 100 degree weather. Um, so we need to ensure that they are protected, that they can take time to, um, time for breaks and water. Um, so we're really uh, hoping to see a society or an economy that actually reflects our true values. Um, and those true values are caring for and thinking about not just ourselves, but our neighbors. Thank you, uh, Karen. Thank you, Wyatt. Thank you, Stuart, for this really great conversation on transportation. Again, we could probably re revisit this at some point, but it's a really great uh, start to helping people think about this as a kitchen table issue, not just for the policy wants and the folks with charts and graphs uh, and budgets, <laughs> but also what does this mean for real life, everyday issues that impact us all. So thank you so much for all your brilliance and um, and eloquence in this on this conversation today. Thank you, Reverend Harris and, and the, the, the powerful team at Virginia Interfaith. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me as well. This was a great conversation. It really was. It really was.